Welcome to the Vault Podcast. Classic music reviews presented by IV Creative. Now, here's your hosts, B. Cox and the crew. Greetings and welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to another edition of the Vault Podcast. Classic music reviews presented by IV Creative. It's a perspective of the classics from a fresh point of view. We appreciate you for taking your time and lending your ears to our perspective. You could be anywhere listening to anything, but you're right here with us, so we thank you. With you today is yours truly, B. Cox, and want to give a shout out to all the fans out there, stateside and worldwide, for continuing to support the show. Guys, we have some great things coming up later on this year. We want to thank you all, and we want to ask you to stay tuned to see other ways that you can support us. We got a lot of exciting things coming up, and I want to make sure you all are a part of it. We want to be able to bless and also include our most supportive fans to give you all a chance to interact with us more directly. So make sure that you all stay tuned and continue spreading the word out there, guys. We love the fact that you all are spreading the word, that the numbers are continuing to show that, and we appreciate everything that you're doing. As a reminder, you can go and visit us at our website, vaultclassicpod.com. Once again, that's vaultclassicpod.com. You can check out the back catalog, leave a review, also leave a voice note. You can also get to our Buy Me A Coffee page as well to leave a donation to show that you support the show monetarily to make sure we can keep the vault open for many years to come. And all of our social media channels are linked to our website as well. Instagram, TikTok, Facebook, YouTube channel are all there. So visit us at vaultclassicpod.com so that you can show us some love, listen to the show, and stay tuned with what we got going on. As we always say here at The Vault, our motto is hashtag open the vault, hashtag nothing but the classics or MBTC. And today we have yet another bonus episode, and it is a segment of Pop Culture Corner, a segment where we take a look at some of the pop culture phenomenons of the past in the 90s and the 2000s. And we like to take that moment to reminisce and talk about those phenomenons and pop culture. And while we mostly talk about music and sometimes movies here, We're going to get into a little bit of a different segment of hip hop culture in the 90s. And we're going to talk about fashion. Yes, fashion. Fashion in the 90s was not only something that was very popular with the audiences, but was also very big business for the brands that were out there. Hip hop fashion in the 90s was something that was very complex. It had many different layers to it. And the amount of brands that were out there competing for the consumer dollars well, was at an all-time high because so many of these brands, whether they liked it or not, whether they wanted to be affiliated with hip-hop and R&B and urban music and urban culture altogether or not, all had a stake in the game. And back then, whether you were a teenager, young adult, or starting really just to get into your own and you were really involved and immersed in hip-hop culture, you could see where the battle for the hearts and minds and the souls of hip-hop fans were out there regardless of whether they openly promoted it or not. So we're going to go ahead and get into it. It is hip-hop fashion brands in the 90s, and we are going to take a look back and talk about some of the brands that shaped the decade. And also, some of them carried over into the 2000s, but these are the ones that pretty much ran the decades into the 1990s. And before we get into it, I just want to at least put out there, we're going to divide this into three different segments as far as hip-hop fashion brands are concerned. We're going to talk about the first one, which were mainstream brands, the ones that I like to call sort of like the elite or the Fifth Avenue fashion game, sort of the brands that define the fashion world. I'm talking about Paris, New York Fashion Week, Milan, these type of brands that were more mainstream, that were worldwide, that were founded by, I would say, in some cases, European designers, some of them American white designers. Some of them were considered to be elite brands, some that were luxury brands. But these were brands that were adopted by many stars within hip hop and R&B. And while they weren't hip hop brands, it was something that if you were out and around that time watching videos, looking at interviews, seeing stars at parties, these brands would be on full display a lot of the places that you went. And we'll go into a couple of these in regards to how they fit in the hip hop culture. So the first segment, mainstream Fifth Avenue fashion world, that type of brand, the elite brands. You got to start the conversation talking about it at least with Ralph Lauren. (laughs) Ralph Lauren, the brand that makes polo, is a brand that was very popular, at least starting in the 80s with hip-hop stars in the hip-hop community, and then it bled right into the 90s. 
they were at the top of the decade. When you talk about brands that were fashion brands that were mainstream in Fifth Avenue, part of the fashion world that were elite brands, as you say, that were at the top. Those were the ones that was at the top. It was Ralph Lauren and Polo, without a doubt. Well, later on in the decade, you had a challenger to that in Tommy Hilfiger. And we all know that Tommy Hilfiger was absolutely huge. Tommy Hilfiger sort of emerged in the 90s and became a very popular brand among the hip hop community. I mean, the one thing that we all remember is being able to see those ads in so many of those magazines. But the most popular one that we all remember is the one with the Leah, with the Tommy jeans, with the bra set, looking absolutely gorgeous. And I think that's what got a lot of us on to Tommy Hilfiger and made us pay attention. Then you started seeing more and more rappers pop up in Tommy Hilfiger. And it became a huge thing. As a matter of fact, Polo and Tommy were sort of like battling for that elite brand to sort of stand among the hip hop stars in the community. And there is a documentary from what someone is telling me out there about the rise and fall of Tommy Hilfiger as a brand. And a lot of it from what some people are telling me is around the notion of Tommy Hilfiger and some things that were allegedly said or said to be said and why it fell down amongst the hip hop community and eventually fell down as the greater fashion community as a top brand. Of course, it's still out there. It's still a brand that does very well. But as far as hip hop folks are concerned, after a while, some of us stopped rocking Tommy. Then you also get into Nautica. And Nautica was another huge one. Personally, my sisters were huge fans of Nautica. I remember them buying me lots of Nautica when I got into middle school. That was a very big thing back then. Another big brand. But then you get into other brands like Calvin Klein, brands like Guess, Perry Ellis, brands that aren't necessarily elite, but they are part of like that mainstream world that you can find pretty much at most department stores anywhere that were somewhat of a hip hop staple. I remember seeing a lot of guest things in the early 90s. Calvin Klein obviously has been something that is maintained throughout time. And then Perry Ellis. I remember I was a huge fan of Perry Ellis clothing, especially I had a Perry Ellis jacket to a good portion of high school. I loved Perry Ellis, but that was a, a big brand. Then you get into like the more elite brands, the ones that, you know, premium clothing, the fashion world were a lot into these brands. And these, as a result, also became very popular with hip hop stars in the hip hop community. Brands like Donna Care in New York or DKNY, Versace, Gucci, Armani, Kuji, Marie Francois Gabard, all these different brands that were European based brands. And a lot of them were, and some of them based like stateside in New York, but became very big. And you would hear a lot of these brands, including the ones I named earlier, being referenced in rap songs. It was sort of like, I guess, a sign of opulence if you either mentioned these in rap songs or wore these out in public because they were a status symbol. I mean, a lot of things in the fashion world were and are fashion status symbols. In that case, being able to tell someone and talk about DKNY, like I remember hearing rappers like Lil' Kim in particular mention Donna Karen. Other rappers would talk about Donna Karen. You would hear that. But then obviously Versace, Gucci, Armani, Gucci being very big, very, very big and hearing those in the lyrics, seeing them in the videos. And it was a status symbol. These are brands that you would see, obviously, in Paris at Fashion Week, at New York Fashion Week, in Milan, at the big fashion shows. Be able to tie that into hip hop sort of made it seem like, OK, yes, we're on these brands. Then you also have other brands, Hugo Boss, Gap, all part of these brands that I sort of put into these mainstream Fifth Avenue brands that were brands that weren't hip hop in nature. As a matter of fact, I would even say that some of them may have not necessarily wanted to be aligned with some of the acts that were sort of promoting their brands indirectly, not necessarily advertising them and being in ads and promos, because obviously the fashion world they wanted to convey a certain type of image. And that image, in most cases, is not usually African-American or African descent. <laughs> it's usually of a certain size, i.e. very thin, what they consider model size to be. So I don't know if they necessarily like the idea of being associated with hip hop. But when you talk about the success that these brands had in the 90s, were they going to say no to the hip hop dollar? Absolutely not. <laughs> I mean, just talking about a lot of these brands and so many of these, I really became aware of 
and what they meant when I was in middle school. And I started middle school, was 12, 13 years old. That's when I started noticing that when my sisters would buy clothes for me, because my parents would buy me regular stuff. My parents were not buying me polo. They were not buying me Tommy or Nautica. They were not buying me Perry Ellis. But my sisters would buy me these clothes. Older sisters would buy me these clothes for me to go into middle school with. So I would go into middle school rocking that Nautica button up or that Tommy button up or that polo. It was something that when you went in our middle school and as you got into high school, the order that you got, the clothing brands were a status symbol for a lot of us. And in the hip hop community, it meant that too. So those are the first ones, that mainstream Fifth Avenue elite brands. But then you get into the mainstream brands that were adopted by the hip hop community, weren't necessarily started by someone within the hip hop community, but were brands that we adopted as a community, hip hop and R&B listeners that were popular with the stars that were a little bit of a step down everyday wear, but definitely cool nonetheless because of what they meant within hip hop culture. You get into the major athletic brands, the Nikes, Reeboks, and Adidas. Now, Adidas mostly got very popular in the 80s, notably to a lot of hip hop acts, but Run DMC in particular. But Nike, Reebok, and Adidas were big in the 90s. Nike exploded in the 90s, coming off of the popularity of what Michael Jordan and Bo Jackson did in the 80s and then continued on into the 90s when Nike then eventually partnered with Michael Jordan to make the Jordan brand, which became huge. And then Jordan's, of course, is a brand as a shoe wear, most popular shoe brand in the world. I mean, by far, if no ifs, ands, or buts about it, when it comes to athletic shoes, the most popular athletic shoe out there. But it just went just beyond the shoes with Nike. You would have the T-shirts, You would have the jerseys that they outfitted for certain universities. I remember back then, there were a lot of universities that were outfitted by Nike, in particular, University of Miami, Michigan, Florida State University, all of them. Alabama were all outfitted by Nike, and it became a big thing to be associated with the Nike brand. So Nike was something that when you talk about 90s in the hip-hop community, was something that we adopted. Then you get into a brand like Reebok, and then you had Reebok that picked up and got one of the biggest chess pieces you could by being able to align themselves with that hip hop and urban music community by signing Allen Iverson after he got drafted into the NBA. And then you had the answer shoe set, which again, they saw the writing on the wall. They saw that there was a different type of player coming in to the league that definitely aspired to a edgier look, definitely aspired to more of the hip hop brand And it was cool. I mean, who didn't want to be like AI for those of us who were basketball fans? He was hip hop to a lot of us. Adidas signing Kobe Bryant to his rookie deal. It was something that a lot of us start to look towards to be like, hey, this is what I want to be involved with. Then you get into the other athletic brands. One of the biggest ones out there, of course, is none other than Starter. The famous jackets. (laughs) How many of us had Starter jackets back there in the 90s? And I can't really even explain to you how this became a big thing in the urban community and hip hop. But I think a lot of it had to do possibly starting with the 80s. And I would say even with NWA with the Raiders gear and then starting to see that everybody was starting to rock those popular starter jackets. I can think about all the popular ones, even where I was in the D.C. area, which was huge. Being able to see those starter jackets, the Raiders one, obviously one of the most popular ones out there. Then you would see also the Charlotte Hornets was another one that was very, very popular. I saw Kansas City Chiefs starters, a lot of different other NFL teams really that were out there. Buffalo Bills, Dallas Cowboys, my team, of course, the Washington Redskins. But you saw starter jackets of all the different type of varieties. Having a starter jacket was also a status symbol. And for me, this was really my elementary school days. So having a starter jacket during that time was really, really a big thing. But I'm going to get to another unpopular one. And that was <laughs> the one that became the boot of the 1990s. And it was Timbaland. <laughs> Got to love Timbaland. You cannot have a discussion about 90s hip hop fashion brands without talking about Timbaland. Timbaland is synonymous with hip hop, despite the fact that it's not a hip hop brand all in all. But you cannot have a conversation about hip-hop music without talking about Timbaland. Did you know Nissan EVs have traveled 8 billion miles? Just a quick trip to Pluto and back. And what did we learn along the way? Well, that an EV can take on the world, like the Nissan LEAF. It can move racing forward, 
and take your breath away like the all-new Nissan Aria. We learned to make EVs that electrify. 8 billion miles driven by Leaf owners globally since 2010. 2023 Aria has limited availability. All-wheel drive expected availability early 2023, subject to change. Because it became a big part of not just the fashion sense of those of us during the 90s who were into that culture. It was also a big part of the music. I mean, it was referenced in so many different songs. If you were wearing boots before Nike boots became a thing, if you were wearing boots, there was only maybe one other boot brand that you could wear and everybody could be okay with it. You had to have the butters with the tree on the side of it. You needed to have those butter Tims with the tree on the side of it. And eventually they had different ones, the black ones, the cinnamon Tims. They had so many different other colors. Timberland blew up in the 90s. Again, another brand that we adopted. But then you also get into the coat brands, the ones that were adopted by the hip hop community that became absolutely huge. First one I'll pull up, of course, was important to me because it was very popular in my area, in the D.C. area, was Eddie Bauer. Now, those Eddie Bauer coats, man, you want to talk about a coat that kept you cold when it was, as New Yorkers call it, and people up north call it, brick outside? Yeah, Eddie Bauer was that. Unfortunately, though, while Eddie Bauer's were really, really great coats, they did have a lot of bad press, I would say, in the mid-90s to late 90s. There was an incident where some black men were stopped in an Eddie Bauer. I think it was outlet store. They had uh, filed a lawsuit, eventually won a judgment against Eddie Bauer that they were being profiled against. In the mid-90s in particular, in the D.C. area between D.C. and Prince George's County, where I was from, there were a lot of robberies that happened where black men and young black men were being shot for their Eddies, and some of them died because of their Eddie Bauer coats. So as a result of that, that was some bad prep. But it was a very big brand within our community. Then you also get into the North Faces, which I would say started probably in the 90s, more so was a 2000s brand, because I didn't really start seeing North Face and Mass until... I was probably in college and then outside of college, but North Face was a big one, but probably one of the biggest coat brands out there that everybody used to rock was Helly Hansen. And Helly is a brand that really, I would say, embraced the hip hop community full on when the hip hop community decided to, I don't know who started that, us wearing Helly, but it became a big thing and they embraced it. And as a matter of fact, as of last decade, Helly made a very big comeback in the DMV in the DC area. And it's something that now that, it was like, damn, where the hell did Helly Hansen come back up again? But those three type of coats, North Face, Eddie Bauer, and Helly Hansen, very warm coats, especially for those of us who are in colder climates. And they were brands that were really adopted by the hip-hop community in some way or the another. So then the last segment I'm going to get into are going to be the urban hip-hop fashion lines that were our fashion lines. That was for urban music and culture. That was made by it, that adopted it, that embraced it. That was by that culture and you couldn't escape it. And you knew exactly which ones, the ones you were dealing with. So I'm going to go ahead and run down a few of those as well. Got to start this one off, which one of the biggest ones, of course, in the 90s, which was the Fat Farm slash Baby Fat line that came out from the mind of Russell Simmons and his wife, Kamora Lee Simmons. Huge hip hop brand. Definitely something that became a bit of a status symbol. That P with that logo on there unmistakable as soon as you see it you know exactly what it means but one of the first ones out there i would say heading into the mid 90s that i was really cognizant of that as i was flipping through the pages of the magazine that i loved seeing the second one of course is out there you know this man it's for us by us fubu <laughs> everybody knows the story of fubu well started by damon john and friends also one of the biggest celebrity endorsers of a hip-hop brand out there was LL Cool J. When we talk about from like 95 to on into the 90s, from like 95 to 99, hip hop was absolutely huge. And this is my high school years. I remember when FUBU first came out. It was really huge, especially in New York. But where I was at in DC, it was huge. And because it was a black owned brand and because this, the messaging of it, of course, was for us, by us, on board. I'm on board right there. So we'll get into another one. PNB Nation, which, you know, I saw at a lot of different other stores was something that I saw a lot of folks wearing more so in the early 90s. But again, PNB Nation, the messaging is there. What gets a lot of us when it comes to these brands that were made by us and were made by the culture and for the culture. One of the biggest brands out there, the brand that became a cultural phenomenon that when you go to their concerts, you see it everywhere and everybody loves to see it. It's none other than the Wu Wear with the W on it, man. 
Wu Wear became a big thing for a lot of us who were Wu Tang fans, and it became cool. And it was sort of like, this is the brand that we're gonna make. It's our own clothing made by us, sort of for us and for our fans. Wu Wear became huge. I remember they even made the song for the High School High soundtrack, RZA and Method Man. The first time that really I saw people wearing Wu Wear, you looking at the Raekwon's ice cream video. I mean, come on, man. It's It was iconic. Really, that W was iconic on anything, but having their clothing line, yeah, it was something that we all wanted to get. So I talked about Timberlands as a boot manufacturer. The other one that was kind of a boot brand that you could wear that was somewhat okay for you to wear, definitely a hip-hop brand was Lux. You know, they leaned into the hip-hop community. I remember seeing a lot of those advertisements in the magazines, especially The Source. Then I also remember the most popular commercial that I remember was the Simon Says one. When Feral March came out with Simon Says, they had one featuring that song, huge. But then you get into also other ones. We talked about another brand, Peli Peli. Peli Peli was sort of like a brand, almost like Averex. And I would sort of put them in the same category as you would like a Heli Hansen. They had great coats, but then they also had good shirts as well. I remember seeing a lot of Peli Peli being mentioned as well by Mob Deep and Prodigy. Also, Joe to see. Then you had John get into the <laughs> conversation. With Sean John, Diddy made up his own brand. And in the late 90s, this was a late entrance into the hip hop fashion brand community. Once it came around like 98, 99, it sped off right into the 2000s and took off. And that really was a thing that I think surprised a lot of us that Sean John, I would even say, reached a height that brands like Fat Farm and even FUBU didn't get to. I mean, let's even say another brand that came out in the 2000s that was started by, obviously, the Rockefeller gang. Rockaware didn't even get to that level. Sean John reached a level that I think a lot of them never got to as far as those urban fashion lines that were made by us. And it was huge to see how big it got, actually, as well. And so Sean John was one that started very late in the decade, but was a very big brand. One of the ones that has, I say... <laughs> I would say has one of the most talked about topics and has nothing to do with the clothes itself, by the way, how it's pronounced. It's NYC. Yes, NYC spelled E-N-Y-C-E. And everyone, I remember seeing a post about this and everyone saying, yo, how do you pronounce this? Of course, the way to pronounce it is NYC. And having read a couple of articles and also heard interviews, that is the way how the brand is supposed to be pronounced. Because it's supposed to be a phonetic spelling of NYC, New York City. But as it was, I guess, when they were developing it and with the Italians, and I don't know whether it was being made in Italy or that they, when they went to say the name, it was being pronounced as Anichi. Because <laughs> that's the way, I guess, in the it Italian, how it was being pronounced. Therefore, that became the way it was supposed to be the correct pronunciation of it. But it's NYC, y'all. <laughs> That's what it is. That's what the brand is. But it was a big hip-hop brand, though. And as up into the 2000s, it still was out there amongst a lot of people. And I remember first seeing NYC when I was probably in my junior year in high school, if I'm not mistaken. Junior and senior year in high school. One of the OGs of the hip-hop clothing brands. Definitely Carl Kanai. I mean, one of the best ones. You saw a lot of folks rocking Carl Kanai. Tupac in particular, there were other ones that were wearing Carl Kanai as well. Lots of rappers were wearing that special ed in the early 90s. And he was a guy from Brooklyn that started a clothing line. And that really was something that they really leaned into the hip hop community because it was one of our own. And then one of the last ones that I want to mention as well was Echo. The red background with the rhino. I mean, unmistakable. I remember DMX rocking Echo, a few other hip hop artists that I can remember wearing Echo as well. It was very popular in my high school, Echo was. Echo Unlimited. Those brands, man, definitely were the ones that were of the culture, that leaned into us, that embraced us, that wanted to identify with being hip-hop and urban music. But then also you want to talk a little bit about the jean brands for the ladies. I can remember in particular three ones that I'll, I'll remember because of how they looked on the ladies when I was in high school and especially in college. There were the Sergio Valente jeans, the Tommy Hilfiger Milan jeans, and last but not least, the GOAT of all 90 jean brands, which was Parasuco's. <laughs> if you know, you know. If you know, you know. So those 90 brands, man, and it really was something that when we looked in the pages of these magazines, when you looked in the source, it seemed like the pages of the source and XXL, sometimes in Word Up and rap pages, 
you would go and look at these brands. I mean, really how the hip hop magazines made their money were from advertising. And you had a lots of advertising in these magazines from the record labels taking out ads to promote their upcoming artists, album releases to clothing brands. And I would say the clothing brands were the ones that I remember the most vividly because you would continuously see them on an ongoing basis, no matter what the issue was on a month by month basis. And you would see the clash between those mainstream Fifth Avenue elite brands, seeing those Ralph Lauren and Tommy Hilfiger and Tommy was huge and Nautica and being able to see the Marie Francois Gibar and Versace and Kuji all being present in those magazines, seeing the commercials at times on television. Like those were the brands that while they didn't necessarily identify being hip hop, they loved the hip hop community money because we always wanted to spend money because it was like a status symbol for a lot of us seeing the Nikes every once in a while, the Timberlands, the North Faces, the Helly Hansons being advertised in the source and then double XL. But then really what reigned supreme was being able to see those urban fashion lines, the third categories. I always saw the fat farms and baby fats, the FUBUs, Wu Wears, Lugs, Pelly Pelly, Sean John, NYC, Echoes, Carl Kanais. You saw those in the hip hop magazines all the time. There was a battle going on between those elite brands, the mainstream brands, and the urban fashion lines that were of the hip hop community of trying to get the consumer dollars all in their pockets. And it was interesting because what it did was, and what I liked about fashion back then is that there was something for everybody. If you had a brand that you liked, you could get with it and rock with it. And it was something that you wouldn't get the same thing from that brand all the time. The fashion was varied. Uh, The clothing, if you had a particular fit that you liked because a brand made that fit, you could go with that fit. Whether you want it to be a little bit more rugged, you want it to seem a little bit more street and wanted to stay true mostly to the hip hop community that was by us and for us, then you got those urban fashion lines that I'm talking about. Those fat farms, fubus, woo wears, lugs, pelly pelly, Sean Johns. If you wanted to show the elitism, yeah, you can go ahead and rock the Versace, the Donna Karen, the Tommies, the Ralph Lorenz, the Icebergs, all those. And if you were kind of in the middle, hmm, then you rock the Nikes. You get some starters or Timberland or Henley Hansen or Eddie Bauer. Like that was the great thing about fashion back then. You had a lane that you wanted to stay in. And if you wanted to sort of get in and stay in and sort of stay in fashion, you had a lane that you can go in. And that was a multiple different price points. And it could definitely be at whatever level it is that you were comfortable with how you wanted your fashion to be. So shout out to the 90s brands. Hit us up, man. Let us know what you think about the conversation. Were there some brands that we left out that I didn't mention? Hit us up and get us in the comments, social media, in the comments, of course, as well, and the episodes on YouTube when this gets up. Hit us up. Let us know what your favorite 90s fashion brand was to rock back there in the day. And what do you think about the brand then? And do you think there's anything that was out then that is making a comeback now that's still relevant? Hit us up in the comments on social media. We love to continue the conversation. And that is going to wrap up yet another edition of The Vault. Please make sure you are visiting us at vaultclassicpod.com. That's vaultclassicpod.com. There you can learn more about the show, check out our past episodes, join our mailing list, leave a review, or if so inclined, you can leave us a voice note. Click the blue microphone in the bottom right-hand corner to leave us a voice note to let us know what you think about the show or to just show us some love. To support the show, click the coffee cup shaded in yellow in the bottom left-hand corner to access our Buy Me A Coffee page. On Buy Me A Coffee, you can give a small monetary donation to support the show to ensure that we can keep the vault open for many years to come. You can also visit us on social media at Vault Classic Pod on IG, Twitter, and on TikTok. Also hit us on YouTube and our Facebook page. Like and follow us on social media. Subscribe to the pod and the YouTube channel. We do it here all for you. We appreciate the support. And if you have a friend, tell a friend and make sure that that friend tells a friend. Always remember to keep your headphones on and your music loud, but not too loud. And as we close, we like to remind everyone to dream big because dreams are the basis for creation. Always create, motivate and elevate because you were never destined or created to stay stationary or ordinary in this life. And on that note, we say peace. Thank you for listening and coming into The Vault. Please subscribe and visit us at vaultclassicpod.com. That's vaultclassicpod.com.